Well, it's fantastic to be here, especially straight after reporting season. Now, one of the features of the reporting season was the amount of corporate and M&A activity that we saw. We saw five bids on ASX 200 companies, including Altium, Illumina, Borel, CSR and Virgin Money. Now, we think that looking forward, that's going to continue, and that's for a couple of reasons. The first reason is we all know what's happened to the rate cycle and global GDP is slowing, so growth's becoming harder to come by. So companies are chasing M&A. The other thing is that balance sheets at Corporate Australia are in relatively good shape. So looking forward, we see this M&A activity will continue. However, before we look forward, we've got to look back and we've got to check the rearview mirror. And that is specifically in regards to capital allocation. And we've got to properly critique and analyse that capital allocation. And the reason why is because how companies are allocating capital is going to have a large effect on the future share price. So I'm going to be talking today about capital allocation. Now let's play a game. Can anyone in the audience tell me the difference between the companies on the right hand side, my right hand side versus these companies here? Any guesses? Okay, so both these companies have ventured offshore. These companies here have ventured offshore with very poor shareholder outcomes. These companies here have had great shareholder outcomes. So what's the difference between these two buckets? Well, Slater and Gordon, West Farmer Borrell, they ventured offshore, they did large scale M&A. So we saw a geography step out and at the same time, they've also stepped out in terms of their product. And when you do those two things at the same time in M&A, that adds a lot of risk to the transaction. The other thing we've seen is these companies have done big M&A and it's typically involved large amounts of goodwill. Cochlear, CLSL and Aristocrat, their strategy offshore has been more organic. It's been a very disciplined offshore strategy. They've grown through using their large amounts of competitive advantage and intellectual property in this business to go slowly and disciplined over time. So let's go through capital allocation analysis. It is often overlooked by the market, but it is so crucial. Now, when you hear a company engaging in M&A, everyone gets super excited. What are they buying? How much have they paid? And they, they zero in on the asset. We at Solaris, we take a step back and we go through our capital allocation framework. The first question and the most important question to ask yourself is who is the vendor and why are they selling? Are you buying from the government or are you buying from private equity? What is the motivation for the vendor selling? The other thing to think about in vendor analysis is how well capitalised are the assets. The amount of times we've seen private equity sell assets either through IPOs onto the Aussie market or through trade sales, and the assets have been undercapitalized. And the next thing is, how competitive was the bidding process? Were there two people in the data room or were there 10 people in the data room? The next piece of analysis we go through before we start looking at the asset is to look at the company's balance sheet post-transaction. What does the balance sheet look like when we look at more mid-cycle earnings and lower cycle earnings? And how stressed does that balance sheet look through those scenarios? What's the rationale of the management team buying the asset? What is their motivation? Is it something to do with their remuneration, such as their STIs or LTIs they're going to hit if they complete the transaction? What is the management team telling us in terms of the synergies? How aggressive? and how achievable do we think the synergies are? The next one is so important as well. How does, post completion of the transaction, how does this change the company's Porter's Five Forces analysis? Has it strengthened or weakened the company's Porter's Five Forces? How does the return on capital of entering into this transaction compare to say buying back shares or investing organically in your own business? And what does this company engaging in this M&A strategy tell us about the organic growth in the business? Is it a little bit slower or a little bit worse than what we thought, hence they're having to gauge in large-scale risky M&A? Now let's go through a case study. Aurora's a Melbourne-based papers and packaging company. In August last year, they announced a transaction to purchase Saverglass. Saverglass is a glass manufacturing business based in Europe, 
with the majority of their operations in France, and they manufacture glass bottles for high-end liquor companies such as Belvedere Vodka. Now, the first and most important thing to look at is the vendor. In this case, the vendor was the Carlyle Group, a global equity behemoth, private equity behemoth. They have $430 billion of assets under management, and they are some of the smartest people on the street. It's not who you want to be buying from. The next thing to think about is Saverglass. It was our understanding that these assets were on the market for 12 to 18 months prior to sale. We questioned how well capitalised these assets are. And the purchaser, Aurora, they rocked up in France like a lost Aussie backpacker and surprised the market with this acquisition. Their market cap at the time was $2.6 billion and they bought these assets for $2.2 billion. A massive bite on the cherry, they've never operated in Europe or France before and it's a slight step out in terms of product. What was most concerning of this transaction to us was the purchase price was $2.2 billion. Now, $1.1 billion of that $2.2 was goodwill. Goodwill is the difference between the purchase price and the accounting valuation of these assets. We expect to see large goodwill in companies such as technology businesses, healthcare, pharmaceutical businesses. Businesses have large amounts of intellectual property in their business. This is a manufacturing business, and that was yet another red flag for us. Now, let's just lift under the hood a little bit more. Have a look at that saver glass EBITDA during COVID. It sure did get drunk on Belvedere vodka. It went from 100 million euros in 2019 to 168 million euros in 2023. This is a GDP type growth business. And having that amount of growth, that was purely from the COVID tailwinds that we know you couldn't go out, to, out offshore, you couldn't go on holidays, you couldn't go out for dinner. So people treated themselves to a nice bottle of liquor at home. We think private equity has been very opportunistic and selling this business at the top of its cyclical earnings. The next thing to think about is Aurora's ROE. It's dropped significantly post-transaction given the large amount of goodwill that they've taken on board. Now, we've been short this company in our long short fund. We remain short today. It downgraded earnings last month during reporting season. And we have a lot of concern that there's future downgrades to come in outer years. Now, you've got to listen to seven presentations today. So let's play a little game of guess who. And if you know the answer, please yell out. This is an ASX 200 listed company. I was born in WA in 1994. I'm currently going through a significant growth spurt. I've outpaced many of the US tech names. That chart is this company versus the Magnificent Seven over the last five years. Any takers? Close? Minres. Minres. We've held this stock in our portfolio now for a number of years. And isn't that amazing that a, a large cap Aussie gold, Aussie mining company has outperformed the Magnificent Seven on a TSR over the last five years. The reason we've gone through this exercise is to demonstrate the large amount of alpha and outperformance you can generate in the resource sector. And going forward, we think that this is going to be a real bright spot. But before we look forward, we've got to look back. Now let's have a look at a chart of the global eight mining companies and their CapEx profile over the last 20 years. Now, during this period here, 2012, 2013, that was when the mining companies went on a very ill-fated M&A splurge. BHP was front and centre. They executed $40 billion on US shale assets, only to sell them to Woodside for $20 billion. Post that, the miners pulled their raids in. They started to return capital to shareholders through buybacks and dividends. And then from there, they went straight into COVID. And they couldn't spend money on growing production in COVID. It was all about running the day-to-day -day operations. And then looking forward, CapEx is starting to creep up again, as you can see by the yellow lines. But a lot of this CapEx is going on decarbonisation. Now, decarbonisation absolutely has to happen. Miners are spending a lot of money on wind and power, solar projects, hydro. But it doesn't come with any production growth. So we've been on a CapEx holiday as we look back, but looking forward, this is going to set us up for a real sweet spot in commodity prices. And that's going to be fantastic for the ASX 200 listed resource companies. However, this is a sector that is really volatile. 
and you can make or lose a lot of money in this sector. So I want to take you to how we at Solaris think about investing in this sector. We've made a lot of our performance in this sector in the past few years. The first thing to think about is jurisdiction. You want to be investing in OECD jurisdictions. I look at, for example, AVZ Minerals. They own the Monono project in Africa, and the Chinese have come in and wrestled it off them. They had a market cap of the ASX, 200 of $4 billion. We think it now could be worth zero. Given the volatility of earnings and the cyclical nature of this sector, you've got to have a balance sheet fit for purpose. There's a lot of capex that goes in this sector, tangible assets. You need a management team who you're back to execute. You want to be at the bottom end of a cost quartile. You don't want to be only making money two or three years in five. So we're looking for companies down this end. And you've got to have a long resource life. Because of the finite nature of their asset, it's constantly depleting. We've seen so many times when mining companies with only three, four, five mine, mine life years left are forced into making poor capital allocation decisions. And the best way to generate alpha in this sector is when mining companies are investing in organic growth. The mine and the infrastructure is already there and they're doing brownfields expansion and in growing their existing mine and putting capital in that way. So we at Solaris, we're very proud of our track record. We're renowned for our consistency and performance and we've outperformed in 17 of the past 23 years. We have a core fund, a long only fund and an income fund. Thank you.